story of a woman named Florence Shotridge who lived from 1882 to 1917. Her husband, Louis Shotridge, is often revered as a preserver of native Tlingit culture at the Penn Museum in Philadelphia. However, many of his early achievements would not have happened without the help of Florence. Her name is not often mentioned despite her contributions to the field of anthropology, and this short documentary aims to fix that. Florence Dennis was born in 1882 in Haines, Alaska near the Chilkoot River. Florence is Tlingit from the Raven Moiti and her clan is Luka Hadi, the people of Luka, or Duncan Canal, which translates to Off the Point. This area is situated in the Chilkoot Kwan, or Chilkoot village near Haines. She belonged to her mother's mountain house as clan identity is passed down matrilineally among the Tlingit. Following traditional rules of marriage, her father belonged to the opposite eagle moiety and was a well-known medicine man. Lawrence also had a brother named Bert Dennis. When recounting her childhood in her article, Indians of the Northwest, Florence states, I was so tired going up these steps that I begged to be carried in the ceremony attending the opening of the house. A long line of women dancers formed around the room, and I cried to be allowed to dance with my aunt. They finally gave permission in spite of the fact that I was of the raven side and the dancers were of my father's side, the eagle. As a young girl, Florence enjoyed partaking in community gatherings, and during this time, Florence went through the traditional rite of passage telling at women endure when they get their first menstrual cycle. Florence details this experience in her only solo authored article, The Life of a Chilkat Indian Girl. But when she was a young girl, Christian missionaries starkly opposed these customs, so they began occurring less often with Tlingit women. Donna Beaver, a Tlingit artist and poet who currently works for the U.S. Geological Survey, shared a similar experience when recounting her mother's upbringing. She was in a strange cusp of time period, too, when the traditions were changing up a little bit. So you had the little swing of modern. It's actually just a ceremonial piece to, you're walking in there as a child, and then you're gonna come out and blossom and be as a woman. So I don't think it was any kind of thing about, uh, like I say, putting them down because they're a woman. It was actually giving him power because women, women are respected in the culture. In her mature years, Florence attended Presbyterian Mission School in Haines. At this time, the US government, which had recently bought Alaska from Russia in 1867 for $7.2 million, banned the use of the Tlingit language and promoted English through missionary schools. Florence's school was in the newly established Christian town at Portage Cove on Lynn Canal. The school was a place where Indians were taught to live in the white man's Christian world. She attended four years of high school here and became a talented piano player, singer, and good English speaker. This is also where she met Louis Shawridge. Their parents had arranged a marriage between the two when they were babies, but they grew very close in their years at school together. In 1902, on Christmas Day, the couple got married. Three years after their marriage, in 1905, Alaskan Governor John G. Brady asked Florence to become a representative of the Tlingit Nation at the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition. It was here, at the Alaskan exhibit, where Florence demonstrated Chilkat weaving. Like many Tlingit women, Florence learned Chilkat weaving, one of the most difficult weaving techniques in the world, from her mother. Her Chilkat blanket shows her great skill in weaving and her joy for teaching non-native Indians about the ceremonious importance of Chilkat blankets. Modern-day Chilkat weaver Lily Hope learned from her mother, Clarissa Rizal, and Kay Parker. Foundationally, anytime there's a color change between yellow and black or white and black, there's always the braid of that particular color. Also enables the like viewer to think that we're weaving perfect circles, right? So Chilkat weaving is like one of the only textiles where we can weave a seemingly perfect circle. Florence was asked by her husband to make this Chilkat rope for him. Following proper rules of art production, these robes are usually made by someone from the opposite moiety. They are worn by high-ranking officials at special occasions like potlatches and are decorated with family clan symbols and worn as a form of pride and connection to home. Lewis belonged to the wolf clan of the eagle moiety. This robe has shark and grizzly bear emblems, both symbols of the wolf clan. The blanket is referred to as the Tana blanket because it includes images of two coppered shields, or Tana, which are crest objects made out of hammered copper. Um, the copper Tana is historically wealth, right? So she's got a lot of 
wealth being built into the blanket. The blanket also features both grizzly bear and shark emblems, which stand out because it was rare for Chilkat blankets to have more than one animal on them. According to Donna, all eagle moiety symbols have teeth or claws, and all raven side symbols are less ferocious. And in Chilkat weaving, we don't use a five-fingered hand. In history, where do we see the handprint? As we go back in time, the original handprints were on cave walls, right? That symbology was almost like a signature of like, I was here, man was here, human was here. We Chilkat weavers leave our ego and presence out of it. Like we don't need to add extra ego to this because it's a gift enough to weave. There is also a human face at the top center of the robe with two mirroring side profiles of a human face to the bottom left and right of that section. Blankets often had human faces on them because when someone wore the robe, the eyes faced inward as a representation of self-reflection. In a short paper she wrote, Florence said hemlock bark is used for the black, the yellow tree moss for the yellow, and the copper ore for the bluish green. In an interview with The North American, an old Philadelphia newspaper, Florence added that she used the wool of five mountain goats and cedar bark. Both Donna and Lily agreed that the colors of Florence's Chilkat robe aligned with the traditional colors other Tlingit people used. While weaving her blanket at the Lewis and Clark Exposition, Florence and Lewis were introduced to George Byron Gordon, then director of the Penn Museum in Philadelphia. Gordon purchased 49 objects from the couple, discussed having them lead an expedition in Alaska, and spoke about the possibility of being hired as employees at the Penn Museum. Florence spent 22 months making her blanket. Lewis first offered the blanket to be sold to the Penn Museum through George Byron Gordon, but nothing came of it. Instead, he negotiated the price of the blanket with Edward Sapir, a famous linguistic anthropologist who formerly worked with the Shotridges at the Penn Museum before moving to Quebec. The letter exchange initially began with a request from Lewis to find employment and housing in Ottawa, where he and Florence could move, and eventually led to Florence's robe being sold to the Canadian Museum of History for $200, which would be around $5,260 in today's U.S. currency. Sapir hesitated to meet this asking price, but Lewis did not allow it to be sold until his price was met. From 1907 to 1911, the couple worked with tutors to help with English and singing while continuing to partake in various travel excursions and Indian craft displays. They were employees at Antonio Apache's Indian Crafts Exhibition, which took place in 1906 in Los Angeles, where Lewis sold Tlingit crafts. This is where Florence finished weaving her blanket. They toured the country with the Indian Grand Opera Company in 1911. Um, well, at that point in time, Wild Bill, he did that Wild West show, and there was a, so there was a lot of demand for that kind of entertainment. But since she wasn't in the Wild West show towards the West, which was a little more wild, whereas on the East Coast, they were a little more fine, the guys with the top hats, so they did formal kind of readings and poetry readings and singing and some storytelling. The couple later participated in the World in Cincinnati Exposition in 1912. Around 1910, it is likely that Florence attended an all-women's college in Michigan to study ethnology and anthropology. Her precise location and years of attendance are undocumented. Florence may have attended either Michigan Female College in Lansing or Michigan Female Seminary in Kalamazoo. In 1912, Gordon offered Lewis a temporary position at the Penn Museum. Florence became a volunteer educator guide and gave young students tours through the museum galleries. During these tours, she wore the garb of Plains Indians. I don't think they had much to grab from the collection, any Klingit outfits. We did trade with the people of North Athabascans and the Chippewa and these other people for those hides. And I'm sure some of those leather outfits were lighter weight. Also during this time, Florence helped Lewis organize and document the museum collections and helped him complete the model of his hometown village, Klukwan, while enjoying travel funded by the Penn Museum. The Chilkat weaver in the house is said to be modeled off of Florence. 
This is when Florence began a second chill cat blanket that was never completed. She has the side braids completely woven. Side braids are the pieces on the outer edge of the black. That's really amazing. It's usually the cherry on top. As weavers ourselves, we save it as the last thing. He has already signed the blanket. We call it the signature, but it's not reliable. The couple during this time likely lived on 4013 Locust Street. This is now a local movie theater called The Rhythm Room. In 1916, with funds from Philadelphia retail magnate John Wanamaker, a member of the museum's board of trustees, Gordon asked both Florence and Lewis to lead the Shotridge expedition and to return to Haynes to make collections for the Penn Museum. This was the first anthropological expedition we know of run by Native Americans, but it is important to note that Lewis was paid as an employee and Florence was not, despite them being co-leaders. Before returning to Alaska, Florence fell ill with tuberculosis, something she had dealt with for some time. Back in Alaska, Lewis and Florence settled in Haines in a house Lewis had set up for fieldwork, and it was there on June 12, 1917, two years into the Shotridge expedition, when Florence Shotridge died. Lewis was shaken by her death and took time before returning to work. Over the course of his employment, he collected 560 objects, 300 black and white photos, and several audio recordings. I originally turned to this project after a trip to the Penn Museum archives when I noticed how scarce Florence's files were in comparison to her husband. I noticed a severe lack of recognition of her own work and the work she did alongside Lewis. But this documentary aims to be as enlightening and educational as Florence herself was when she once taught in the Penn Museum halls over a hundred years ago.